Welcome to Concept 4 Notes. We are going to dive deeper into covalent bonds, which you were already introduced to in Concept 1, Intro to Bonding. But now we're going to learn how to name them and write the chemical formulas and all that jazz, just like we did for ionic. So just a reminder, covalent compounds, which are also referred to as molecular compounds, since covalent compounds make molecules, are they are just a compound formed when two or more atoms are sharing electrons and they form between non-metallic elements. Now, remember bonding is a spectrum and we know if something's gonna be more ionic or covalent based on the difference in electronegativity, the delta En between two different elements. And covalent kind of has this wide range because they can be the bond can be a nonpolar covalent bond or it can be a polar covalent bond. So if the difference in electronegativity between two atoms um, exists, like if there's one at all, then that means that the bond is a polar covalent bond um, because the electrons then are unequally shared. One of them has more of a pull, a greater attraction on the electrons, so it's going to pull the electrons their direction. So for example, look at water right here. It's um, two hydrogens, which are these blue atoms here, and one oxygen. And oxygen has a higher electronegativity than hydrogen. So oxygen is going to pull the electrons a little bit more. They're still going to share them, but it's going to pull them a little bit harder, attract them more than the hydrogens. And so we use these little deltas and the positive and negative to indicate the partial charges, the poles within this compound. Overall, this molecule is neutral and it's not an ionic compound. It doesn't have like a positive ion and a negative. It just means that this side is a little bit more positive and this side is a little bit more negative. Now this is different than when the difference in electronegativity is zero. That is uh, indicates a pure nonpolar covalent bond because the electrons are equally shared. And so here's an example between two oxygen um, atoms that make O2. Notice we have none of the deltas, none of the partial charges, none of the poles indicated because there aren't poles. They would share these perfectly equally because neither one would have a stronger attraction of the E. So they're sharing those electrons fully. A reminder that the term molecule is specific to covalent compounds. It is a neutral group of atoms that are held together by covalent bonds. And a single molecule is an individual unit. It exists on its own. We can look at just one of them at a time. So for example, here's a picture of one glucose molecule, C6H12O6. Here's a picture of one water molecule, H2O. These are both molecules. And this molecular formula is its chemical formula um, in these covalent compounds. Now, over here though, look at sodium chloride or table salt, NaCl. Notice I did not outline in purple because it is not a molecule. Also notice that I'm not just looking at, you know, one Na and, or, you know, and one Cl. I'm looking at this entire crystal structure that forms in a one-to-one -one ratio. So the NaCl indicates that there's one sodium for every one chlorine. Okay, whereas with covalent compounds, we can really just look for at one individual molecule at a time, which is unique. A term to know with covalent compounds is diatomic elements. This is when two atoms of the same element exist naturally as a molecule. So the ones that you'll need to know would be hydrogen, nitrogen, oxygen, fluorine, chlorine, bromine, and iodine, or iodine or iodine. They don't exist on their own. Like when you're inhaling oxygen right now, you're inhaling O2. You're not just inhaling O. So they exist like this. And because it's two of the same bonded together, these are always forming nonpolar covalent bonds. They're equally sharing those electrons. Now, in terms of stability, covalent compounds tend to still follow the octet rule of desiring eight to get those full outer energy levels of electrons. And when we see when they share electrons and they form bonds, they can do, you know, three things. They can make a single bond, a double bond, or a triple bond. So in a single bond, they're going to share two electrons. Uh, an example would be what we see in um, hydrogen, H2. So there's two hydrogen atoms. They're going to share that, and so it would form this bond. That one dash represents two electrons shared. Another example we could see is water. So we've got two hydrogen at, um, atoms, one oxygen per the chemical formula. Those will share and those will share. Um, and now notice that's one oxygen and one bond to one hydrogen, one bond to another. So these are single bonds sharing two electrons each. So 
oxygen here has two lone pairs of electrons and two bonding pairs of electrons. But they can also form double bonds, which is where you're going to share four electrons between two different atoms. Looking at O2, if we draw the Lewis structures for each of those atoms, which we've done also in our activity at the beginning of this unit. Those would share and those would share. So that's going to form a double bond between these two oxygen atoms, two dashes representing four electrons shared. We see this similarly in carbon dioxide. So um, you have one carbon and two oxygens. And now you may be thinking, how did I know to put carbon in the middle? So the least electronegative atom always goes in the middle with the exception of hydrogen, which is never in the middle. So carbon has a lower electronegativity than oxygen, so it's going to go in the middle. So it's going to share two electrons with this atom and two electrons with this atom, which makes four total on either side. So we end up with these double bonds on either side, a double bond with this oxygen and a double bond with this oxygen. And here carbon has no lone pairs. It only has bonding pairs, um, which is interesting. And then a triple bond is just going to be six electrons are shared. So we see this when we look at N2. So they share one pair, two pairs, three pairs. That's six electrons total and we get that triple bond there. Now something I want to introduce you to is Vesper theory. We're going to talk way more about this in concept five, but you may have noticed when I did some of those drawings, like with the water, I went ahead and like drew them on an angle, or when I drew, you know, nitrogen in two, I drew it not at an angle, and that was intentional because I was anticipating what we're going to learn about a little bit later which is these Lewis structures are great, but they don't show the three-dimensional shape of these molecules. They're just showing a 2D shape. And so I try to do my best when I'm drawing them to represent that three-dimensional shape because of Vesper. So the Vesper theory, which is also known as the electron domain theory, um, or Vesper just stands for the valence shell electron pair repulsion theory. So Vesper is a little bit easier to say. It's just the tendency for electron pairs to be as far apart from one another as possible. And why do they do that? Because the valence electrons are repulsed by each other. Remember, like charges repel. So they don't want to be near each other. So when we draw this, we're not going to draw these electrons right here over here because they don't want to be this close to all these electrons. They all want to be as far apart as possible. Same here. We're not going to draw the hydrogens off to the side here right next to these other oxygens because they're going to want to be away from them. And then we see that here. So whenever you're drawing these, I'm not going to expect you to do these perfectly at all. We will learn more about this and this three-dimensional shape, this molecular geometry um, in concept five. But I do want you just to consider as you're drawing, how can I space these out as much as possible when I'm drawing these? I'm going to practice these now. I want you to draw the Lewis structures for each of these three molecules, and then we'll go over the answers in class. Now, one other thing I want to mention specifically for you honor students is what resonance is. So resonance is bonding in molecules or ions that cannot be correctly represented by just one drawing, by just one single Lewis structure. So instead, we would say that the you know, compound would resonate between these structures. Okay, so for example, ozone, O3, it's three oxygen atoms covalently bonded to each other. So you could draw it this way or this way. And we use an arrow going both directions to show that it would, in real life, probably resonate between these two structures. So I just want you to recognize that that exists. And if it was on a test and I asked you to draw O3, like if you drew it this way or that way, it wouldn't matter. Like both would be right. Technically, the most correct way would be to draw both of them with the arrow to show the resonance. But again, I just wanted to point that out to you. One thing I also want you to be able to draw as um, an honor student is a polyatomic ion. So I think this is like the third or fourth time we've defined this, but that's why you got to know it. It is a positively or negatively charged, covalently bonded group of atoms. And you may be thinking, why are we talking about this? It's an ion. It should have been in ionic bonds, which is true. But it's the actual ion itself, the inside of it is atoms that are covalently bonded to each other. And so I want you to be able to draw those as well. And so... The only difference here is based on the charge, you're going to add or take away that amount of electrons when drawing. So for example, NH4, to draw NH4, you're going to draw one nitrogen with four hydrogens, and then you're going to erase one of the electrons. 
and that's how you'll get that one plus charge. And then the notation after you draw it, so you may remember nitrogen normally has five valence uh, electrons around it. So we had one, two, three, four that are shared. And then that fifth one just gets oh, goes away. It gets erased, and that's where it gets that one plus charge. So you'll draw the polyatomic ion, and then you'll put parentheses around it, and then indicate the charge. Okay, another example. Let's look at sulfate, SO4, with a 2 minus charge. So you would draw one sulfur with four oxygens bonded to it, um, and then it has this 2 minus charge overall. So you'll put the parentheses around it and then indicate that there. And we'll practice that a little bit too. Okay, now we're going to get into naming covalent compounds just like we did with ionic. And I think this is so much easier with covalent, which is why we started with the hard ones with ionic. And now we'll do the easy ones with covalent. So the main thing with covalent is that we're going to use prefixes. So with our first and our second elements, we'll use prefixes. And that's going to tell us what the subscript will be when we're going the other direction. And a prefix is just something like this. 3 represents tri, 4 represents tetra, 10 represents deca, and I will give you this as a reference. The only exception here is that for the first element, if there's only one of them, we just don't say mono on the first one. I don't know why. You say it on the second, but that's just the rule. And then you're going to name the second element with a prefix, and then you just add an IDE ending. So let's do an example. P2O5. All right, so name the first element phosphorus with a prefix. So there's two of them, so we'll use di. So diphosphorus. And then name the second element, which is oxygen, with a prefix, there's five, so pentaoxygen, but then you need that IDE ending, so pentaoxide, so diphosphorus, pentaoxide. And typically, if it's like an A and an O back-to-back, -back, you just get rid of the, you know, A on these, if that makes sense. Okay, let's do some. I want you to try those, and then we'll go over them, and we'll do some more practice in class two, just the first part of this. And then, um, just for the sake of the video, we'll keep going, and let's go the other direction. So you'll just... Literally, there's only one step. You use the prefixes to determine the subscripts. That is it. So whatever this says tell you, tells you how many there are of each. So a few things to note. If you don't see a prefix, you assume that means one. And then you do not simplify. So if it's P204, you do not reduce that to P102. You know, you leave it. Because remember, ionic, we simplified because it was a ratio. This is literally telling us how many there are, so we're not going to simplify it. Okay, so... What would be the chemical formula for dichlorine monoxide? Well, di means two and chlorine means Cl, so Cl2. And then mono means one, oxide referred to oxygen. So Cl2O. That's it. Okay, I want you to practice some of those and then we'll go over those in class. We'll do the second part of this practice handout as well. And then one last thing I'm going to teach you as honor students is how to name acids. So in acid is a distinct type of molecular compound. So it's a distinct type of covalent compound that has one or more hydrogen atoms that makes hydrogen ions, so H+, when it's dissolved in water. So when we take this, this compound, we dissolve it in water, those hydrogen ions leave it, and that's what makes this an acid. And we're going to talk about this more in our acids and bases unit. But there are special rules for how to name these because they, they're a little bit funky. Um, so let me just give you some examples and then I'll give you some steps. I think that'll be the easiest way to do this. So like hydrochloric acid refers to HCl in a water solution. So, you know, HCl, if we follow the covalent bonding rules would just be hydrogen monochloride. But if I'm referring to HCl in water, dissolved in water, then I'm technically talking about hydrochloric acid. Okay, so that's an important distinction. So here are the rules. For binary acids, so just hydrogen and another element like HCl, HBr, HF. Okay, it's always H and one other element. That's it. That's a binary acid. You use hydro and then you use, use the base name of the anion. So chlorine, chlor for chlorine, fluor for fluorine, bro for bromine. And then you add ic and then acid. So again, we saw that here. Hydro, chlor, Ic acid. Another example, hydrosulfuric acid. Sulfic would be wrong, but I know that's a little tricky to know if you're doing sulfic. Sulfuric is tricky, but hydrosulfuric acid. You know, HBr would be hydrobromic acid. Okay, that's how you name a binary acid. 
Now, oxy acids are different. That's when you have hydrogen, oxygen, and then one other thing. Okay, hydrogen, oxygen, and one other thing. So, now, if the oxy anion has an I-T-E ending, so go back and look at your polyatomic ions. If it's sulfite, chlorite, something like that, then you'll use the base name, and then you'll add us. So chlorite, you'd use the chlor, and then us, chlorus, and then acid. So chlorous acid or sulfurous acid for sulfite acid, that kind of thing. So H2SO3, so it's hydrogen, it's oxygen, and one other element. We look up the anion, which is SO3, which is sulfite. It has an I-T-E ending, so we take the sulfur, and then we add the us, sulfurous acid. Now, if that oxy anion has an A-T-E ending, like sulfate does, then you do this differently. You use an ick at the end with an acid. So H3SO4 would be sulfuric acid. Okay, so these are tricky, I know. It's a little bit easier if you practice them and just follow those steps one by one, which we're gonna do. And then we're just gonna do some more covalent compound practicing. So for me, I don't need to stress about the acids. I'm really not that, I'm not gonna emphasize it that much. Will it be on the test? Yes, it'll be a small portion. Really focus on getting covalent compounds down first and then we can work on acids a little bit more, okay? So don't stress about it and let's just do some practice and get you really good at these.